We are live. We are live. Hope everybody had a good weekend this weekend. If you're like me, I got a little bit of a longer weekend. We're all live with Peter Morton out there in L.A. hanging out. Y'all might recognize Peter from television and some movies. I kind of recognize you from one of my favorite TV shows on Hulu that I've been watching. Oh, uh, Which one's that? Dave. Ah, oh, yes. Somebody <laughs> shot me. <laughs> that guy's funny. That whole little dicky character is is, is is funny as could be. Yeah, he's great. I, I heard about him a couple of years ago, and I actually saw some um, footage of him freestyling earlier on. And he's, he's really talented. He's good. Yep. We have uh, Liz says, what's up, Sergeant Hart and Peter? What's going on, Liz? Vicky says, hello, Mr. Wharton. Hey, Vicky. Vicky. Uh, Scott says, hello. Hey, Scott. Hope you're doing good. And everybody that's tuning in, you guys be sure to share this up. We want you to drop a comment and let us know what's your favorite possession movie that's based on a new true story. And that's something we were going to discuss tonight. Um, you know, Peter's very passionate. You need to definitely look at madmonster.com and some of the marvelous stories he's written uh, for us with us on this topic. Peter, what, do, what when you say think possession movies based on a true story, what's one of the ones that you that pops to your mind that you like? Um, hello, I think Peter. Can you, can you can hear, hear me? You? We can hear you now. Yeah. Perfect. Maybe I've got to be closer to the screen. I don't know. Um, I was saying The Exorcist for obvious reasons. Um, all the others are kind of just imitators. That movie, nearly 50 years old, and it's just incredible. Yeah, I think you're freezing up a little bit, Peter. Not sure if you can hear me, but The Exorcism is a real-life possession story. For those of you that don't know, it was kind of took place in the 1940s. And when I think of horror movies, and I've watched movies like Friday Thirteenth, Halloween, um, you know, all my favorites. I've watched them a gazillion times. But The Exorcist, I might have only watched that like one or two times because it's just, it's just terrifying and disturbing on so many levels. I mean, who else on here finds The Exorcism, The Exorcist, disturbing? I mean. It's based in the 1940s. A little boy named Roland Doe it, it was the person that took place. The Lutheran Church did an exorcism, and things got worse. Um, I think he says freezing up yet. Hopefully we'll get Peter back. I'll let him work out his technical difficulties. Norman says, what's up, Sarge? What's going on, Norman? Scott says, exorcism for sure. And another disturbing is the exorcism of Emily Rhodes. Let's see. We Can you hear us, Peter? And I made some adjustments, so hopefully I'm going to be with you. I apologize. Now, I was telling them the exorcism, that I call it exorcism, but the exorcism, 1940s, a little boy named Roland Doe. Yeah, pseudonym for um, a little boy in um, Maryland, 1949, um, was supposedly the uh, the inspiration for we William Peter Blatty's book, The Exorcist. Um, it's really interesting when you go into these things because there's so much conflicting information about what actually happened in real life. Um, so try, to try and get to the bottom of, um, you know, based on a real life story could be pretty, uh, pretty murky stuff sometimes. I think a lot of times, uh, Vicky says, 
The Exorcist yet disturbing the remake was 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 worse. Scott says the Exorcist for sure, and another one is the Exorcism of Emily Rose. Yeah, the Exorcism of Emily Rose again, based on a true story. Um, I remember that being really effective. I think I only saw it once. Watched it with my wife. Got some very effective scenes. I'm not too familiar with the real life case behind it. Um, but the um, thing is with Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I guess with possessed movies, The Exorcist was and is the godfather. So, you know, all, all the others that follow it are just imitators. And The Exorcist still has this incredible power because uh, it was shot by William Freakin, who was a documentary filmmaker. So he really understood about getting under people's skin. And so that's why, you know, many people say with The Exorcist, you can watch it multiple times and still notice new things. It's really, really fascinating film. So if there are any of us who haven't seen The Exorcist, probably not in this group, but um, it's, it's kind of a quintessential watch. Um, Exorcist, Emily Rose, I remember my wife being terrified by it. Yeah, that was based on, uh, and they said it was loosely based because, and a lot of times, you know, I believe that they get conflicted information is because there's money involved. And when Hollywood comes in, and they say they want to make a picture. It takes a lot to make a picture, you know, get greenlit and to make a, a big budget movie. So I do think people can tend to be a little bit uh, eager in telling their story. But behind every, you know, even if they lied, behind every lie is usually some half truths. Mm -hmm. And yeah. When you look at like the exorcism of Emily Rose, it was based on a German woman who in the, I think it was the mid seventies. She, you know, some people said she was mentally ill. Some people said that she was possessed by a demon, but at the end of the day, she died because of all the exorcisms and because of the physical stress of oh, yeah. the possession. Yeah. I mean, have you seen um, uh, The Devil and Father of Morph? No. Have you seen that? So it's a documentary that William Freakin made um, literally two years ago, I think it was. Now, when he made The Exorcist, he always said that, you know, he's a strict um, atheist. He doesn't, you know, believe in God or anything like that, um, which enabled him to have, I guess, such a clinical view of the filmmaking process and not be so kind of invested in it. But he, um, in recent years, has become a lot more interested in real life possession, I guess. And he uh, he made this documentary about the last surviving um, exorcists, I believe that was uh, officially appointed from the Vatican. Um, and he passed away, I think, last year. But it's a pretty fascinating documentary. And William Freaking came out of it saying that it changed his opinion on on all of it because um, he was a staunch like non-believer but after coming out of that experience he said his opinion changed and he's i've met him a couple of times a pretty fascinating guy he's not a bullshitter you know he's when he says something like that is to be taken um seriously now norman says he can't watch it again he's talking about the exorcist and i was pointing out earlier that like halloween Friday the 13th, Nightmare on M Street, House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects. I mean, I've watched the movies a million times, and I might only have watched The Exorcist half a dozen to a dozen times just because it just gets under my skin every time I see it. It's just very disturbing. Yeah, I mean, again, it goes back to the, the people involved in the making of the film. It was nominated for a whole bunch of Oscars, The Exorcist. You know, people forget that. It's um, it kind of transcends, uh, you know, your regular horror film, and I know a lot of people who haven't seen it dismiss it, but it's it's an incredibly powerful piece of cinema, and it still holds up fifty years on, and that's saying something, really, isn't it? Uh, we have Kendi Sarte. We have um, Andrea says hello, hello, Andrea. Hey, Andrea. The, uh, the other movie that kind of, you wrote an article about this on MadMonster.com, The Entity. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that case. 
So this is, um, the movie's fantastic. It's not a lot of people have seen it. Um, but it's it's basically about a woman who moves into a house and um, is, is she's sexually assaulted by um, ghosts, by uh, spirits, poltergeists. Um, and the real life case behind it took place here in Los Angeles, actually in Culver City. Um, the lady's name was uh, Doris Bither or Doris Bither. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it. But um, Doris moved into this uh, new home in Culver City and shortly thereafter a, a, um, a, a Hispanic woman approached her door and started saying that this house is evil and, you know, you, you need to leave. And then after that, she started to experience some really odd occurrences. Um, it's a fascinating case. There's lots of uh, different articles about it online. Um, do check out the one on Mad Monster because I try to be as you know concise and give an overall picture of of the case as possible. Um, but again, there's not a lot of information, like factual information, you know, photographic information, film information, which was available at the time. But there's not a lot to kind of support what the story is um, or what Hollywood would believe you uh, would have you believe the story is. Now, another case that I think I have mixed feelings on this, and I want you guys to weigh in on the comments, is the Amityville Horror case. You know, you have the whole, you know, we, we talk about what we could prove versus what we can't prove. The one thing that gets me with the Amityville Horror case is that, you know, Ronald wiped out his whole house. And he was convicted of murder. So we know in that house, a whole family was wiped out. And at trial, they tried to use a defense that he was possessed. He had played with the occult. There was something in the house. And then you had the Lutzes move in for, I think it was 13 months. What do you think of the Amityville horror case? Um, again, you know, there's uh, the, the Lutzes who wrote the story um they've I, I think they've been kind of disproven uh that you know apparently they came up with the whole thing over a bottle of wine with a i think it was a lawyer friend of theirs um but it's it's undeniable that some pretty horrific stuff happened at that house and i think if you go into a building that you know has that energy you are immediately going to be kind of preconceived to think certain things so and we we all know right i mean it's your mind can play tricks on you especially when you're in certain circumstances and at different heights of you know anxiety agitation whatever um so you know I, i'm not saying that the stuff that happened to the lutz is they didn't experience strange things but i think the sensationalism of it all you know the book the spin-off movie I think it was it was all intentional on their part. Uh, Levi says, I don't know it, if it's because I saw it first when I was a kid, but the Amityville Horror scared me as much as the Exorcist did as well, maybe a bit more actually, even though the Exorcist is a better film. First up, hey, Levi, respect. And... Um, Norman said people in 2020 are full of the same demons in the exorcist. Maybe so. <laughs> An interesting point. A lot of Pazuzu's running around. And when you look at that, I mean, there is a financial motive for wanting to have the Amityville story and the Warrens were involved. And in some circles, they're really expect respected. And in some circles, they have their naysayers just like with anything. But yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, 2020, everybody has an opinion on something. Um, and that's kind of the problem. That's that's where we are in the world today. You know, everybody feels that they have to a right to their opinion. And maybe not everybody should, you know, be so or be able to be so vocal with their opinions. Um, the Warrens, again, you know, they've they've been involved in countless cases, and I've read a lot of mixed things about them. A few years ago, we had, so I, I worked at the Chinese Theatre in Hollywood with Levi, actually, he was just typing away there. Um, we had the premiere of The Conjuring 2, 
and um, um, uh, Lorraine Warren came along um, and I think she, she, she had to leave early because she felt at that theatre there was this presence. And I think she, a friend of mine said that she, she left early because she said there was an ominous presence of the building. Um, so I, I do know that with The Conjuring 2, and I really like the first Conjuring, The Conjuring 2 I hated because they took a case that came out of England, a really well documented case called the Enfield Poltergeist, and they completely fabricate the whole story around it. And they involved the, the Warrens who weren't involved in that particular case very much at all. Um, and I really dislike that movie. But the first Conjuring movie I thought was great. Um, Hollywood are now trying to create universes in uh, the horror world. They've been trying to do the, you know, the Dracula, uh, the universal classic horror mo uh, monsters. And now they're trying to do it with, you know, The Conjuring and its spin-off movies. For me personally, I, I think I'd rather watch a really good, deep, thorough documentary on some of these cases to see the evidence for myself so I can get truly scared. Because, you know, this, this jump scare nonsense doesn't really get me. Uh, yeah. And especially if it's a Bloomhouse production, I got a comment here I want to address real quick. Because mm. uh, in the internet, you know, anybody can get on here and type a comment. We got Mark asking me, why you call yourself Dr. Horror? Hell, you ain't even scary, LOL. Well, LOL, I don't call myself doctor because I've never been to medical school, but I did serve 10 years in the Marines, so that's why I call myself Sergeant Horror. And I'm glad you don't find me scary because I'm a clown. And I, I mean, like Sid said, I mean, what the heck? You don't like clowns? Don't we make you laugh? I mean, what's your problem? But back to the topic at hand, uh, Scott says Amityville, true or not, still creeps me out. I like part two better than part one. I don't think I've seen part two. I, part, I really got to watch it. Part two actually covers the brother, the, the brothers, the brother Ronald killing his family. And, oh, okay. So they go like a prequel. Yeah, which which really should, they should have took that from the beginning. But I understand, mm. and it it is what it is. I I too like the first Conjuring. It had a couple of good jump scares. When you're talking about the Conjuring universe and you're talking about Bloom House, I think James Wan is a master of horror. He gave us the first few Saw movies. Um, and then he went on from Saul and started directing every everything in the world. He's a really talented director, but they really got to get away from just doing the jump scares. Yeah, I mean, I, I come from a different line. I'm, I'm nearly 40 years old, so I come from a different generation where um, it's all about the the shadow of the monster rather than the monster itself because it's, it's so much more effective you know the build up the tension um and i do find that with a lot of you know modern horror that it's not there um but well not for me personally you know that tension that that what i'm wanting to feel when i watch those movies um ari Aster, who did hereditary and midsummer recently i think he's one of the best horror directors working at the moment in my opinion i know not a lot of people agree with me or um, there are some that agree with me, but not as passionately. But I, I, I do think he has that knack of getting under your skin and giving you kind of this really unforgiving imagery that just, you know, gets, gets to you. I, I like Midsummer. I think he needs to cut his movies down to a, a his storytelling down to a, to, to a, a, a acceptable runtime and save the long movies for the director's cut. Heredity was like, they, the little engine that could, it was like, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I don't know how I'm going to end this movie. Let's just end it. It, 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 it didn't have, it didn't pace itself properly. But I do think in the next three or four movies, he's going to end up being a superstar. Yeah, quite possibly. I think you're, that's, a, that's a correct assessment. But what um, was it there for? I, I don't know. Y'all I mean, go, go watch Midsummer this weekend. <laughs> Or this week, <laughs> if you haven't watched it, yes, it really is. It's a wonderful summer movie to watch uh, with the family. Good uh, 
Matt wanted to know, is there any truth to paranormal activity? No, no, I believe not. I think um, that was, uh, was a really low budget movie that um, um, they came up with and uh, Steven Spielberg saw a cut of it and he championed it and he really made it what it became um, by pushing it to a mainstream audience. Uh, you know, I think the last truly kind of effective movie like that might have been the Blair Witch Project for me. Um, and maybe that was the first as well. Yeah. Again, uh, I like paranormal activity, but again, it became this thing of, you know, when, when you sequelize something, and they used to do it all the time with the nightmare films and, you know, the Jason movies. And, um, but when you sequelize something, you take something away from the original. Um, and uh, paranormal never really got me in the way that... Um, some of the others have now dane mentioned that he likes color out of space the best love craft story adaption check it out i've heard about this this is a recent one actually color out of space um yeah i'm gonna look into that and hi dane um scott says Her heredity gave me a new appreciation for telephone poles um, the Haunting in Connecticut, that's another possession movie that's supposedly based on a true life story. Have you, I haven't seen it. it mm. it's, it's a good one. It's basically the son has cancer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can compromise the immune system. They move closer to be to the hospital and the house that um, they live in actually used to be a funeral parlor. That's, that's not going to be good, is it? No, no, <laughs> I can no. tell already there's there's trouble, trouble of brewing right there. I lived in a house one time that used to be a funeral parlor. Really? Did you have any strange occurrences? Yep. I was little, and I remember my dad waking us up in the middle of the night, like three in the morning, and said, let's go. And wow. How old were you? I was like five or six. Whoa. No, I was, I was six or seven. And um, they never said anything about it. And then after I became an adult, I asked them about it. And they found out that the funeral director lived upstairs. The funeral home was downstairs and the bombing was in the basement. And the funeral director's daughter fell down the stairs and broke her neck and died. Oh. And... I guess they saw the daughter at the top of the stairs. Whoa, that's creepy. Yeah. Did you personally experience anything like I didn't on that occasion, but what I, I got to doing is I, I watched uh, Zach Baggins' Demon House. Mm -hmm. That documentary. A lot of people have mixed feelings about Zach. I want to see that, actually. What was your verdict? Huh? I want to see that one. What was your verdict? Did you enjoy it? I mean, Zach's a good showman. So he he, he does enactments, which gives it a good production value. I understand why he does it, but mm -hmm. I like to see the documentary style have visual content. So when I was sitting here, you know, sitting at the, at the house watching it, I started watching ghost adventures and I thought, is this stuff real or is this stuff fake? So the only way to figure it out is to go experience it for yourself. So I flew yeah. out to uh, Tonopah, Nevada and went to a town called Goldfield and stayed at the clown motel that's up there and stayed at the Mizpah hotel, which are two haunted hotels. And I now believe <laughs> Are you not going to elaborate on that? You well, happy? I'm like, well, tell me, what well, next? Well, well, well. well y'all go think I'm crazy, but the guy at the clown motel just bought it, right? Uh -huh. So he was remodeling it. So I told him, I said, I want the picture that's in our room. And it's an old painting. And he said, I, I nobody ever gave anything away in this motel, but I'll give this to you. So I brought it back and some strange things started occurring, you know. 
So you 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 have a possessed painting? Is that what you're telling me? I don't know because I put it in a storage unit right now. It's in a storage unit, and ain't nothing been going on at the house. Hmm. So what I'm thinking one night is, do you have you ever seen the oculuses that they use on TV? The the eyeglasses. The oculus is uh, it 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 picks it emits radio waves and the entities can manipulate the wave and it says a word. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. I got one of them. I'm thinking one night we'll have to go live and do an ovulus session with the painting and see if it is haunted or not. This is interesting. Well, maybe you should put it up live and see if people start experiencing strange things. That's good. People to tell us. Um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, personally, I've never experienced anything. And, uh, you know, I want, I want to believe. I'd love to experience something strange, but um, I haven't experienced anything strange. That about the closest I came was a friend of mine, and she was a teacher, and she uh, told me once that she had um, a pupil who had a ghost photograph um, that was taken on her phone. So I said, "Can I see it?" And she said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." She wasn't. She didn't think much of it, but I saw this photograph, and you can actually look it up um, online, um, and I, I immediately thought. There's something really freaky about this because it's um it's of a girl in a bar and in the background is um a figure all dressed in white. It appears that this figure has her hands tied, and um, we looked into the history of the uh, the, the pub, it's a public house and bar um, over here, and the, the bar's been there for hundreds of years. And apparently, this girl hung herself in the top. Oh no, she was executed. That's right, she was executed for poisoning her father. And her name is Mary Blandy. And you can look this up. I think you can see the photo online. But when I saw that photo, it still gives me chills when I look at it. Because I guess because I kind of discovered it. But, um, yeah, that's about the, uh, as close as I've come to anything, you know, truly freaky. But I really want to see this haunted picture now. Now, Chris says, was the entity a true movie or not? Yes, it was based on a true story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they did change the names, um, but it, it, it was based on a true story that happened in uh, in Los Angeles, Culver City, Los Angeles, um, in the 70s. And uh, apparently the, the, the woman it happened to, Doris Bither, Doris Bither, I'm really not sure of the pronunciation, um, B-I-T-H-E-R, uh, she then moved from the house and she still was followed uh, apparently by this entity, it kind of plagued her for the rest of her life. Hmm. But yeah. It, Mark says, I'm here watching. Good to see you both. Good to see you, Mario. Oh, Mario. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, welcome. And then Matt said, house I grew up in as a kid, I was in the room on the computer home alone when the door slammed so hard the door handle went through the wall. Whoa. It's kind of freaky. And he said, in the same house, my brother was sleeping when the whole bed started to shaking until he stood up. And Scott says, do it, referring to the clown painting. Oh, yes. And Liz says, yes, let's see the painting. I'll get it out of storage. Now, another thing. Another oh, movie, sorry. I'm sorry. The another movie that you mentioned before that you wrote an article on the Changeling. Could you tell mm -hmm. us a bit about that? Because you actually talked with the director of that, correct? I did. Yeah, the um, uh, director, a gentleman named Peter Medic. Um, again, the case was pretty uh, pretty interesting. Um, there's a lot of you know fact versus fiction, but essentially it involves a, uh, a composer moving into an old house. He um, experiences some strange things. He finds a secret uh, attic, um, and in the attic he finds uh, the remnants of a, a young uh, disabled boy who, I guess, lived up there and died in the house. Um, the Changeling was a movie that I had seen many years ago, and uh, I rewatched it recently for the article, 
And again, it's really, really good. I mean, the Amityville Horror is a great movie. These are these movies that are coming out in the 70s. Um, so, still some of the best horror movies ever made came out of that decade. Um, and yeah, The Changeling, again, has this real, real creepiness that is kind of totally unique. There's a scene in it, a, a, a spirit writing seance scene. Um, and it's it's amongst the most creepy uh, cinema I've ever seen, which is brilliant. Now, another movie that I kind of got thinking of was uh, came out in 2012 called The Possession. I don't know if you remember that about the girl that became possessed because of the divots box. The box, yes, yes. Now, pretty sure. Pretty sure I saw that quite late and a little bit drunk. <laughs> now, the Divix box is actually at Zach Baggins Museum in LA. And, oh, really? Vegas. and oh. I saw it. And supposedly he either just recently opened it up or he's going to open it up on his TV show. So I kind of want to see what's in. He had it in a glass case surrounded by salt. And it had already started opening a little bit of it on its own, and some of the salt was removed hmm. or disturbed, not completely removed. And he had the devil's rocking chair that he got from the Warrens. I would love to go to the Warrens occult museum, but that's right now. Yeah, it'd be a pretty amazing place to uh, have a wander around, I imagine. And uh, it, 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 I'm, let's go back to the Amityville because we did get a couple more questions. People asking if we thought it was real or not. I'm kind of up in the air. I mean, we know the murders were real, but as far as if it's actually haunted, I guess the key question would be that I want to ask you, Peter, would you spend the night in the Amityville Horror House? You know what? If you ask me that, maybe five, five, ten years ago, um, I would have said yes without hesitation. Um, as I get older and wiser, came a father not so long ago, about to become one again, um, you start to consider your actions a lot more. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I, I, my, my dad used to tell me, my dad was a non-believer. I grew up a Catholic, I went to Catholic school, I had to go to church every Sunday, and I did it all for my my mum's side of the family, which was extremely Irish and devout Catholic. Um, but my dad told us when I turned sixteen, you can pretty much you know do whatever you like, make your own decisions, which is what I did. Um, so uh, I've I've always been interested in the other side, paranormal stuff and and demonology and all that sort of thing. But I remember my dad saying to me. You know what? As a non-believer, he said, it's probably best not to go too deep down certain rabbit holes. You know, don't go dabbling because you're, you're kind of asking for trouble. There's a hotel here in Los Angeles called the Cecil Hotel. And there was a very famous case from 2013, which you probably heard of. Uh, Alyssa Lamb um, was a young student who was traveling. She was found in the tank of the hotel, the water tower. Up on, up, up on the roof and there's a lot of you know conspiracy theory stuff online including extremely creepy video of her in an elevator where she appears to be communicating with something that's not on screen um, just before she died and you know I wanted to go and investigate that place and that hotel when I first heard about it for Mad Monster um, but then I did a little bit of online navigation and uh, some things I found kind of crept me out and I was just like, you know what, I'm going to maybe maybe not invite those sort of elements into my life because it's better to be safe than sorry, right? When it comes to stuff that we don't know about. I would stay. I, I would actually, if it came up for sale and I didn't have the money to buy it. It was like eight nine $900,000 plus. I really don't want to live up north anyway. I kind of like it being by myself down here. And you know, I'd live in it and do live stream from it and host freaking horror watch parties there. We would turn up there. 
be amazing and you could probably make a lot of money. And I would say you're a much braver man than I am because I, I don't think I could stay there. Even though, you know, I don't necessarily think the whole story is true. I definitely think, you know, when, when horrible things have happened in places, uh, there could possibly be some sort of residue, you know, something left behind. And um, maybe if you invite it, you might be, uh, might be unwise to do so. Vicky said her family moved to an old farm type house in Missouri. I was six or seven, looked up and saw a man figure that slowly materialized. I would see the light fixture through him. He had a mask on and his arms were crossed, looking down on me. His hood over his head looked like the guys in the old days who cut off heads for a living. I've been the that ever since. Wow. It's interesting. We've had a few, I think Matt earlier on, we didn't address him, but he spoke about, um, you know, uh, growing up in a in a haunted house and then Vicky there was talking about it um it I'd be curious to know if, if uh, any of those guys looked into the history of the houses to you know find out if, if things did happen there and just to be clear it's a big difference between just a haunting and a possession right yeah absolutely I mean haunting can be you know anything from you know doors opening and closing, um, seeing things out the corner of your eye. Possession normally is something that, you know, focuses on one individual and, um, you know, just possess it, takes them over, um, makes them change into uh, often kind of uh, scary beings. Yeah, I mean, the idea that something could take over you and make you do things and you're not able to control yourself it has to be scary. And it makes me think how easily it could be confused with having a mental health problem. So I'm wondering how many dangerous demonically possessed people have just been thrown away in an asylum and left to rot until the demon is done with them. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think the, you know, the Catholic church take a real, and strict view on what they categorize as, you know, possessed. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're understanding more and more about mental health um, as the years go on. I mean, it wasn't so long ago, historically speaking, that they were literally drilling holes into people's heads thinking it was going to cure them of certain conditions. So, you know, medically, we're starting to understand the mind more and more, <clears throat> and certainly things like possession. Um, are difficult to uh, to say one way or the other. But I think, you know, um, the, the M4 Poltergeist case is, a, is a, a great example because this young girl in, in England, in London, Enfield, England, supposedly became possessed by the, the previous inhabitant of um, the house. And down to the fact that she was able to say his name, the place he died through his voice, <clears throat> and um, that's interesting to me mainly because it's the first time in history that a civil servant, a police officer, documented um, something supernatural happening. Apparently she saw this police officer who was at the house, saw a chair fly across the room, and she documented it in a police report. Um, it's not often that you hear uh, of, of verified accounts like that. Um, so, yeah, sorry, what, what were you talking about? I think I went off on a tangent there. No, nah, I was I was just enjoying it because you mentioned, you know, police officer. You know, that makes me think of the Deliver Us from Evil. Yes, yeah, Ralph Sarchi. And that's uh, interesting uh, because he was affiliated with the Warrens too. Yeah, he um he's he's he works frequently with the Warrens, um, a New York uh, police detective. Um, who kind of fell uh, unwillingly into working um, as a demonologist. Um, he's got a pretty interesting... They made a film a few years ago with Eric Banner. Really like Eric Banner. I think he's a great actor. The film, it didn't, you know, do great at the box office. It was okay. It was watchable. But, um, you know, definitely not an accurate portrayal of the stuff that Ralph Sarchi documents in the book. But yeah, it is interesting when you have people like police officers, um, you know, who are 
supposed to be, you know, uh, reliable, credible. Um, when they document this sort of thing, you know, it brings it to a whole kind of next level of, and that's why I say I'd love to see a thorough, I'd love to see a, a Netflix six part documentary on the Amityville house covering everything, you know, um, the history of the house, the case itself, and then the naysayers, you know, the people who say it isn't true and, um, and the debunkers, um, because I think, you know, to, to get a full account of something, you have to really do a bit of investigation. Now, Chris had a question. It says, is it true that the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre were so low budget they actually used real corpses to save money? I think they were using real animal corpses, weren't they? Because apparently it stank on set. It was disgusting. Yeah, they didn't really use it. To the best of my knowledge, I've never heard them say that they used real, but that was one of the movies that there's not a drop of blood in the original one. No. You know, but there was no need, you know, when Leatherface is sawing them up, you never really see anything, and I think that's one of the geniuses of that. You, you know, it's fascinating because obviously I'm from England, that's hence the weird accent. Um but in England, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Exorcist, even The Evil Dead, I believe, they were banned. I couldn't watch these movies as a kid. <laughs> so they became, like, mythical. And we would go to these film collector's fairs and we would pick up bootleg pirated versions of these movies that were filmed off of a, a cinema screen out here and sent over to England. And you'd watch this really bad version of The Exorcist or The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which only added to its appeal. Um, I had a chance of seeing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre a few years ago in a cinema in London, and I think it was me and maybe five other people were in the screening. What an experience! I mean, that movie is like it, it, it drills into your subconscious. I, I'd love to go to England, I haven't been over to that part of Europe. Because it's so old, you have all the history. You can only imagine what's creeping around in some of the buildings over there. Yeah, hundreds of years. Well, anytime you want to go, Sergeant Horror, I mean, let me know. We'll, we'll take care of you. In my part of the world, in a little town called High Wycombe in England, there's the uh, the Hellfire Caves. And that's kind of what the, uh, the town is uh, famous for. And the Hellfire Caves, Lord Dashwood, he built these caves specifically so you could hold all these kind of crazy orgies. Um, and they're still there to this day. Is I watched the uh, orgies? Yeah, he would hold orgies down in the caves and also Let's some go, weird man. stuff. Do they still have the orgies? Do they have an orgy? Just you and me. <laughs> Do they still have the orgies in the caves? No, it's more of like a, you know, a national heritage landmark nowadays. Oh, oh. Um, but they do show horror movies. They showed, uh, I saw Gremlins down there in the cave. And I'm watching Gremlins on this cave wall. And all of a sudden, this bat flies across my head. It was crazy. I and thought you down. a whole different direction with that story. But you watch Gremlins in an orgy cave. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, like 200 years before, people were holding these these mass orgies, probably in the very spot that I was, you know, getting comfy to watch Gremlins. Yeah, if I go to England, I want to go, you know, probably party a little bit too, go to some orgy cave stuff like that. That'd be fun. They know how to party in England. I, I cracked open this beer here in honor of Mark Richardson because I've seen him here on uh, the live feed a few times, and he's always. Having a beer, you know, he inspired me. So, yeah, we do like a drink in England. What's this now, Liz Ann? Yeah, Liz says one of my coworkers who was Jamaican had an incident where he attacked a family. He was growling and snarling, then crying and asking for help. He ended up seeing a doc and put in a hospital, but they wouldn't, they couldn't find anything wrong with him, and no other incidents occurred. He was let, later released and no one had ever heard anything from him before he disappeared he was so happy and singing all the time and it was completely out of character so strange isn't it yeah how i mean it's 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 fascinating how the mind works and how you know you can snap like that and um go a little bit cray cray but you know possession i think to, to be classified as true possession, you would probably have to have something otherworldly 
happening at the same time you know something unexplainable to you know whether it be the floating you know levitation or um you know just speaking in a foreign tongue i think that's another one you know speaking in a language that you've never studied or learned before um so yeah for, for it to be like true possession i think you have to tick off a number of boxes well i did have kind of an encounter with the situation where there was someone possessed and it's sort of well documented this possession belief and I'll briefly kind of talk tell you about it. It's in the 90s and mid 90s in a country called Liberia on the western coast of Africa. Mm -hmm. And Liberia has uh, two of the tribes that lived in the countryside that back in the old days they massacred each other. And th then, they, then they came together because this demon approached the tribes and said, I will protect you, but you have to give me one each generation of your tribesmen to possess. And through that person who would be the tribe's witch doctor, I'll protect the tribes. So during the, when Samuel Doe was the president of Liberia, there's a gentleman by the name of General Button Naked, whose real name was Joshua Bly. He was claimed he was the witch doctor of that tribe. And the way he explained it is that when God casted the demons out of the angels out of heaven, they all fell on earth. And these are the demons. And this particular demon fell in Liberia. And he wanted to be worshipped. So at first you hear the story and you think, oh, general butt naked, that's crazy. But all the Liberian generals had crazy names, you know. Well, yeah, general butt naked specifically, he would go into battle butt naked. That was his yeah. whole thing. He would he would eat the heart of a child. He's documented talking about this in documentaries. Yeah. Um, he would eat the heart of a child to give him power for battle and he would go into battle but naked so that's that's why he had that extraordinary name but that's fascinating were you actually in liberia yeah i was in liberia in 96 at uh, monrovia at the u.s embassy the embassy was almost overran and the u.s army couldn't hold the walls so they called in the 22nd marine expeditionary unit we came in oh my gosh. we really wanted to kill general but naked and he would you know, I've seen him up close and personal. He would drive down the end of the street in front of the embassy, get off his motorcycle, do a little dance, and the battle would begin. You know, they would fight. And whatever actually happened to him was he wrote a book, which I got a copy around here somewhere. I actually got hired to write a, a movie about him. Wow. But he... He was living in a in, in a in an apartment during this time fighting the revolution. He was actually before the revolution. He was the spiritual advisor to President Samuel Doe. So it wasn't like this was some unheard of guy. He was the spiritual advisor for the former president. And basically, what happened is he got the demon possessed, the demon casted out of him, and now he's a Christian preacher. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's what he does now. He's completely repented his old ways, and, and uh, yeah, it's fascinating to think you were there. We're gonna have to talk about more about this probably offline. Um, but that that's amazing to me because I, yeah. I saw a documentary on him a few years ago, and I was like, this guy is probably one of the most extreme dudes I've ever seen, and he is incredibly charismatic about it as well. You can see why people are kind of following him into battle because he is a charismatic guy. Uh, it's yeah. so interesting how in these cultures, you know, Liberia and even in parts of Africa, there are still these incredible superstitions about demons. And I, there was even an, a, an outbreak, a couple of years, a vampirism outbreak in one of these small African villages where people, this, this guy was eating people, like sucking and draining people of their blood. And then other people started joining in. It's insane, isn't it? It is. And I don't know if the, what documentary it was you watched, but the, a buddy of mine made a documentary about General Butt Naked called "The Love of Liberty." Wasn't and, that? I think the, you know. I think it was the Vice one. Vice okay, the one came from England. Yeah. 
Yeah, we it, 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 watch the love of liberty. He's got those shells that the demon put underneath his skin, and there's no scars or anything where those shells are. And he would touch the shells to, to activate specific powers the demon gave him. And, I mean, I've seen him. You know, you guys, we're some good shots, and we, we weren't able to take him out. I ain't saying it's supernatural, but. Well, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's going to eat the heart of a kid. You, I mean, Jesus, you'd want him to give you superpowers, right? I mean, this is just mental. When when I saw him saying that, I was like, no, hang on. Did he just say he ate the heart of a child to give him uh, immunity, uh, what, uh, invincibility? That's what he said. It made, it made him invincible in battle. Insane. Uh, Travis says, when I was younger... I would have dreams of flying and going to places I'd never been, and I could tell you everything about the place without being inside awake. I haven't been able to have those dreams as I got older. That's hmm. interesting. That's um, what do they call that? Um, Out of body experiences, trans something. I, I think astral traveling, right? Astral travel. Yeah. Did you see Doctor Sleep? Was it last year? Doctor Sleep. Yeah. The the. Uh, sort of sequel to The Shining uh, with Ewan McGregor. Um, they do a big bit about astral traveling in that, where you leave your body while you're sleeping, you're literally able to travel to uh, wherever you want to go to and be there in a in a kind of spiritual form. Now, the whole Liberian situation kind of reminded me, do you ever remember a film called A Serpent in the Rainbow? Yeah, so that was, was that Wes Craven? Yeah, the don't let them bury me, I'm not dead. You know, that was a spooky. No Pullman, yeah. Oof. Yeah, voodoo. Again, this is the, these are all areas I'm really fascinated by because they take place in this world. You know, they are there's a certain kind of reality to this mysticism. Voodoo, um, and, you know, it's uh, witchcraft and the occult has always been fascinating to me because of that, because it could be your neighbor or, or a colleague at work. You never know. It's, it's very real. And it's um, monsters and, you know, demons could probably be more in like the realm of fantasy. But demons kind of have the crossover path, don't they, from reality to fantasy. You can have a lot of uh, liberty there, I guess, with demons. Yeah, I mean, super... Besides The Exorcist, I don't really find supernatural demon possession movies that scary. For me, the thing that scares me is the serial killers, you know, people that are hunting other humans and getting them and locking them up in their basement and keeping them as pets for years and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's our next level, isn't it? Where um, these guys are like sharks, you know, hot sharks hunt alone sharks before they're going to bite you they'll bump you you know serial killers stalk their prey and they plan and they execute and they're methodical and that is a whole next level of disturbing isn't it yeah i think one night we need to talk about i have a theory i believe the serial killing business is dead dna <laughs> kind of killed it you know I, well, I don't know i don't know i think there's a lot of um cases i mean geez, there's so many unsolved cases and the, i mean the golden state killer just got sentenced this week didn't he, yeah, he, he admitted his guilt. and that was that's the case that's been going on what 45 years um so i wouldn't say that i'd say that maybe we as um a mass population of the planet are not being as informed about you know serial killers being brought to justice or you know maybe there's a reason for that maybe we, we only get a few serial killers um every you know five or six years to kind of keep our macabre interest but you know on a daily basis i guarantee they're capturing people responsible for mass killings um so you know it's just what what are we not being told because the serial killer business as you said um is probably going out of business because the I mean, 80s were, I guess, the, the prime time for serial killers. I mean, you got to think in the 70s, they didn't have DNA. They didn't mm -hmm. have cell You didn't have cell phones. Now, 
you can't go out. I mean, to 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 effectively be a serial killer, you gotta go through the process of hunting, you know, surveillance, and then capture and do what you want to do. And to do that, you cannot have a cell phone on you because your cell phone pings from towers. You cannot have a bit of DNA to drop off on your victims because you know hair follicles. You know, even if you're wearing gloves, if you're extra sweaty or have more, depending on the type of gloves, you can secrete through the gloves. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to interact with another human and not leave a trace of some type of evidence. Hey, yeah, but it's only, you know, if people are looking for evidence. You know, a lot of these cases of uh, people are showing up dead and they're just writing off on the, on the report, uh, you know, death by asphyxiation, death by suicide, death by drowning, um, because, you know, nobody's either championing their case or, or having... So there are so many unsolved crimes that are not being investigated, you know. So evidence, as, as you well know, evidence can be wiped out in a second if, if you show up to a crime scene and it's not handled properly. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, the serial killer business is probably rife, as rife as it's ever been, because when you think about it, it's not... There's not lots and lots of people out there serial killing. <laughs> um, there's only a few, um, but it's we're not finding out about them. It's, a tough, in, it's a tough industry. Uh, Vicky says, my husband wants to know, what do you think about Lizzie Borden trial? Do you think Lizzie Borden did it? Absolutely, I think Lizzie Borden killed him. I, I think she's pretty guilty, yeah. And Eric says, evening, Sarge. Evening, Eric. Evening, um, yeah. We've been on about an hour. That's usually how long we stay on. Do you got anything you wanted to close with, Peter? I really appreciate you joining us. No, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I, I guess just one final thing on serial killers and um, the exorcist. There, not a lot of people know that there is a serial killer in the exorcist. Um, in the director's cut of the film, uh, one of the technicians who works in the lab where Reagan gets her um, her uh, tests done, he turned out to be a serial killer. And William Friedkin actually went and interviewed him in prison, and he was the inspiration for the movie Cruising, which starred Al Pacino. Um, so, if you have never seen The Exorcist, now is a good time to watch it. it seems we've been talking about possession, and then um, yeah, may, uh, maybe next time we can talk a little bit more about serial killers and you know your top five. How about that? That sounds like a plan. We need to make that happen. Everybody, I appreciate you guys for watching and tuning in with us. Be sure to go to madmonster.com and check out Peter's articles. I mean, the changeling, the entity, some great stuff on there you definitely have to read. I appreciate you all watching. Be sure to share this. Tag a friend that you think should be watching this. And until next time, Sergeant Horror, Peter, we're out for Mad Monster. Good night, guys. Thank you.